Okay, we're back. This is uh, Jay Fidel. It's Think Tech Hawaii. It's Energy 808, the cutting edge. And we have a really Im important, interesting guest today. It's uh, Commissioner Naomi Kawai uh, of the PUC. Wow. Okay. And um, Marco Mangelsdorf is my co host. And we're going to get into a discussion of what it's like to be a commissioner on the PUC. Very exciting stuff right after this message. Marco Mangelsdorf, welcome to the show. Naomi Kawai, welcome to the show. Marco, it's your turn uh, to introduce Naomi. Well, mahalo to you, Jay. Thank you so much, and especially to Naomi uh, Kawai uh, for joining us today. I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this. Naomi and I have been doing some corresponding over the past uh, weeks, and uh, it's great to have you on the show, Naomi. So uh, mahalo, mahalo, nui. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is just kind of uh, lead off with uh, asking for kind of your personal intro as far as uh, the path you took or have taken to now be one of three, one of three in the uh, the triumvirate there, the Public Utilities Commission. So uh, uh, I'm all ears. He, he wants to know because he wants your job, Naomi. He, he, give, him, give him the full bio so he can apply, you know what I mean? No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Jay. Uh, well, geez, I actually, uh, when I graduated from college, I was very fortunate to work uh, for then Councilmember Donna Kim, who really taught me about public service and um, kind of the benefits of, you know, working for in government and uh, the public. And uh, with that, she really served as a mentor on how to analyze things and got, got me interested in going to law school. So after several years, I did go off to Lewis and Clark um, and I specialized in environmental land use law, which is what I intended. Uh, I practiced a couple of years in Oregon and Washington before coming back. And I've been practicing over 25 years as a land use environmental law and regulatory attorney uh, representing a variety of co uh, clients from uh, small businesses, uh, large developer types, as well as um, the government. You, you, could fool us, you could fool us about that. You must have graduated law school very early, like four years old. I, mean. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so if I, if I could just kind of follow up on that, I'm really kind of curious to hear uh, so at some point, uh, we knew uh, we knew last year that, uh, that there was going to be a six-year term opening up at the Public Utilities Commission, which is the purview of uh, two uh, two bodies, so to speak. One is the governor, one is then, and then the Senate for advice and consent. So uh, at some point, you entered into some type of um, discussion with uh, Governor, then Governor David E. Gay, or one of his uh, one of his lieutenants. And I'm wondering what was going through your mind in terms of, hmm, you know, you were well established already in your previous lifetime, right, Naomi? Yes. And what was going through your mind as far as, well, this is an opportunity, right, to to get into public service and, you know, ostensibly a six-year commitment. And what was going through your mind in terms of the pluses and minuses? Was it a very difficult decision for you to, to, to leap when the opportunity of a commissionership came up? Yes and no. I, I really want to go back into government. Uh, and it was essentially my second big opportunity to actually go back into government. The first one being uh, back in 1990s, sorry, 2003, um, I was uh, given the opportunity to uh, joined the AG's department. Unfortunately, the offer was made at a time that uh, my son was being born. It was just wasn't a good time. And um, when I heard that uh, the position at the PUC was opening up, I, I was truthfully very excited about it. I, I thought to myself that this is a great opportunity to use all my years of experience um, that I've gathered so far and all my years of representing um, private businesses and trying to really make government more efficient and more effective and, and serve the public in a different capacity uh, coming from the private sector and using my legal background in 
really representing government and the people of Hawaii. So it was just an outstanding opportunity for me, one that I, I couldn't imagine that I would be here. It's such an honor to be able to serve Hawaii in this capacity. Um, and I'm just really fortunate that um, I was given this opportunity. So just so, one more follow up on that, if I may. So I always like to ask this question, which is, so we all come into a position like this or any, any kind of new job with certain kind of anticipation, expectations and assumptions, because it's part of human nature, right? It's kind of trying to put some, some known into the unknown. So compared to what you anticipated or what you expected, what has struck you the most uh, in terms of su surprises or, oh, gee, I didn't even think of that. And, and yet, you know, you've been into it now for uh, uh, almost seven months. So uh, what, what has surprised you the most? How hard my staff work. My staff is amazing. Um, I, I never, you know, having filed things before the public utilities questions, and you always wonder what's going on. Why is it taking so long for the commission staff to issue a decision or what, what, what's going through their mind. And you're, you're just thinking to yourself, well, okay, well, this is typical government. They're, they're not doing their job. Um, when I came here, I'm like, okay, you know, we have to give the public and um, applicants predictability. That's what businesses want. One way or the other, if, it's, if we're gonna go down with a project, we're gonna go down with the project, we're gonna go up, go up. But you have to give predictability to the private sector. Um, that's the only way that we're, uh, private businesses are going to, um, you know, survive. Um, amazingly, given the amount of dockets that are before the commission, I'm always amazed at how hard my staff work in researching the issues um, that we give them, um, responding to our questions. Um, you know, when we go through the docket and the record and we have questions. They're the first to either acknowledge that, yeah, there, there's a hole in the reasoning and the logic and the follow-up, or um, just, I might have just very simple questions about how things work. I mean, I, I'm not an energy attorney by any means and I don't didn't profess to be. So I had a lot of questions of staff on how things worked and how does, how does this turn to this and how does this interrelate with this? And they spent hours with me, just going through and educating me on all the various energy dockets. So I am just amazed at how professional and smart and dedicated my staff is at the commission. And um, I think people should realize how hard uh, the staff works. I really appreciate you sharing that because I've known a number of the staff over the years as well. And I just have always had the utmost uh, admiration and aloha for how hard they work. And you're right. I mean, it's easy for people to kind of gnash their teeth and saying, what's taking the commission so darn long to decide this issue that when uh, there's, uh, you know, I don't have the stats in front of me, but compared to 10, 20 years ago, I mean, the volume, the volume, the depth, the intricacies, the complexities, I just got to believe have increased multifold. And, and yet it's not as if the commission's brain power in terms of manpower or people power has gone multifold. That's just not possible in this age right. of, uh, you know, you got to watch your budget and so forth. So I really appreciate your answer. So Jay, I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you. A mm, couple of things to follow up on. You talked about consistency. Now that's not the same thing as precedent, is it? It's kind of um, an analytical consistency from right. one case to the other. So when, um, you know, litigant, if you want to call it litigant, litigant walks in the room, um, he can have or she can have some sort of sense of where this is going to go based on what you did before. Um, I guess, you know, what where I my question comes out, if you want to have consistency, you have to look before the seven months. You have to look in previous terms, previous compositions of the PUC in order to find out what they did in order to achieve that consistency, right? How do you do that? So I said, yes, you're absolutely correct. But keep in mind also, a lot of those uh, preceding decisions have been changed through legislation. So um, a lot of times I have to look at 
what was the legislative intent behind a, a law that the legislature passed? And they keep changing the laws. And so we're always, me and the staff are constantly saying, well, how does this affect our analysis in this particular docket? How does it change things? Um, and then when we write our decisions, I have to make sure that when we're writing your decisions, we're ex adequately explaining how we arrived at a decision, especially if it differs from how we treated the issue in the past. And that's very important. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do at the commission is actually issue a new set of inclinations. Um, the last inclinations uh, document was issued back in 2014. And with three new commissioners essentially on board um, and two very new commissioners, we thought it was important to give uh, the public an idea of where we're heading and what, how we're looking at things and what we're trying to accomplish. Inclinations, given, uh, inclinations uh, are, are they are inclinations unanimous, or can you dissent from an inclination? What happens then if you don't agree? We actually, there's a lot of time. It, I think that the three commissioners here, we all have same vision, the same end result. Now, how we get there, we we may differ, but and we but we talk a lot and collaboratively try to problem solve through um, things that we might differ on. And if we have to write a dissenting opinion, we have to write a dissenting opinion. But I think we come from three different backgrounds and we respect each other's backgrounds. I think that's very important. Uh, the chair comes from a very knowledgeable planning background and he knows the ins and outs and how everything is related from a planning standpoint. And he's been doing this for over 30 years. And I, you know, he, he gives us, he reminds us how our laws interplay with other laws. That's very important. Uh, me, I, I'm the legal background. I'm always looking at, okay, well, why does this, this doesn't make sense from a legal standpoint? How do we back this up? Where did you get this from? And then uh, Commissioner Yost, I mean, he's, he's also a lawyer, but he's more, more importantly, he came from a business aspect and he, he knows how businesses will respond to things. And he's always questioning hey, you know, why are we taking this position? This doesn't make sense from a business perspective. So I think we respect each other's perspectives and we try to make, make it work. Mm. Yeah, uh, and you guys, you do have a diversity, although you and Yost are both lawyers and both from the, call it the business community, your, your view, your participation in the business community was way different than his. Right. And so you have a certain diversity among the three of you. This is good. You agree that this is good? I think it's important. I mean, I can't imagine where we would have, we would all three can't come from the same sector. I don't know how past commissions did it, but the fact that we have this diversity of backgrounds and gives actually a different approach to problem solving. We all look at things and we kind of throw things, well, what about this? What about this? And we're always um, throwing out ideas on how to accomplish our objectives and reach the results that the legislature laid out for us. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's valuable. That sounds terrific. You know, Marco, really, you ought to file the application. If you don't want to file the application, I'll file the application. Sounds terrific. File uh, the application for what? For PUC. <laughs> he, she told you how to do it already. I hope you made notes. <laughs> now, Naomi, you talk about change, you know. And before the show began, I was telling you about this hot scoop thing today mm -hmm. over an Israeli, you know, engine that weighs to 10 kilograms and can power a car for 750 miles, a new kind of electric approach. And so there's a change in the technology. Furthermore, the legislature, I don't want to say anything you don't know, but the legislature is in session and no commissioner's life or property is safe while the legislature is in session. <laughs> so. You guys follow this stuff, do you follow the technology, and do you follow the legislature? Yes, 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 and yes. I mean, we're constantly uh, attending forums online, researching things. If, if anything, each one of us is going through um, literature and investigating things or articles, and we're always trying to keep on top of things and the newest trends, uh, both. Um, in the United States, but internationally as well. Uh, the chair is uh, you know, very good at trying to bring 
people in to educate us on newest trends on energy development. Um, in addition, we're always monitoring the legislature. The legislature calls us up um, all the time and says, hey, think about this, think about this. And it, it's, it's great. I, I love the um, participation and all the ideas being tossed at us so that we can accomplish the goals. Oh, I'm so happy to hear you say that. You know, I mean, we at Think Tech, we believe strongly in that, trying to follow the action because the world is changing so it's much. So fast. So, uh, Marco, I asked you, you know, what, what surprises you had, um, you know, what delights, if you will, you have um, in the last seven months. And so I, I would like to ask you the flip side of that. Um, you know, what, what, what troubles have you had? What, what troubles do you see? What, what impediments are imposed on you that maybe you didn't expect uh, about being a commissioner? Is, are you working too hard or are you, are you <laughs> having issues of one kind or another? Um. Well, it is the state. <laughs> but, um, you need, no, you need to say no more. <laughs> it can only move so fast. I can. I only have so many resources to accomplish. Um, I guess for me, um, no, I don't work any harder or less harder than I was in private sector. I, I think I'm working just as hard. The difference is I feel re-energized. You, you kind of get to a place in private practice where you're like, okay, I'm doing the same old thing, same old thing. Uh, with this, I feel like I'm so excited every single day to like get up and research and read and learn new things. That's the great thing about this job is I get to learn so many new things that, uh, you know, touches upon our daily lives. And it's exciting. Well, it's I mean, exciting it really to hear you say that. It's exciting, you know, really. That's fabulous. I was telling you before the show, too, we really appreciate commissioners coming on and talking to us and sharing their thoughts, you know, being real people, if you will, and sharing their excitement with us. It's so important that we, we the public, know you. We, the public, can, you know, see it from your point of view. And it's great to have you on the show. I just had to say that. Um, so let's talk about some of the issues that, uh, you know, that are happening that turn you on. Uh, don't take. Don't tell us anything that would violate any any kind of uh, quasi judicial uh, limitation. But tell us what what kind of dockets make you you know more interested and make you excited the way you are. Um, I think one of the big things that we're working on as commission right now is the equity docket. Um, actually, uh, my entire morning was spent on planning for the equity docket and what our objectives are and our goals and how we're going to. Uh, get more participation. So for me, that's very important. Um, outreach, I, you know, being a environmental land use attorney, that's a kind of a big tenant of my practice is reaching out to the communities that are being effect, affected and thinking of a ways outside of the box, uh, uh, totally different from how the commission was doing things before in trying to do outreach to um, disadvantaged communities or affected people, um, people who are affected by our decisions, either economically, um, geographically, or socially. So that's what we were doing all morning is basically uh, brainstorming on how to do improve our outreach to those communities. Yeah, we know our society, both federal and state, you know, it has certain issues and it's incumbent on every one of us, including officials and non-officials, to do something. You know? And it sounds like that you know you're in a kind of a, a transition or transformation in in your thinking uh, the, that is the PUC because you you undertake to do something for our society. How how close do I how close am I to being right? I think you're right on the nose. I think that the three commissioners, if anything, we don't accept the thought that this is how it's always been done. So we're going to continue to do it. I think uh, we come from the perspective of in order for us to better serve our constituency is we have to do things a little bit differently. We have to think outside of the box. We have to get to decisions faster. We have to do more outreach. Um, so we're always looking for ways to accomplish those goals different from what we've done in the past. I and staff it. has I been great in responding. It. I'm blown away by your comments. Really, Naomi, I'm not kidding. And that's why I'm going to turn it back to Marco so he can continue and drill down on some of your initiatives. 
Well, maybe in the interest of getting a teeny tiny scooplet. So, and when the uh, so-called inclinations paper came out in 2014, written by Memory Serves Mike Champ, Lee, Mina Marita, and Lorena Kiba. I mean, I remember reading it with uh, with really big eyes because uh, it was it was pretty 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 provocative in a number of uh, places. And now it's uh, what nine years later, right? So things are different now from then, which is the nature of uh, linear time, of course. Right. So when do you think that we can eagerly anticipate getting the PUC's new in the works inclination paper so that uh, we can read it? Well, right now we're just in the beginning phases um, and I think it would depend on whether or not Commissioner Yost is actually appointed to the position because obviously if there's a different commissioner that comes on inclination paper will change but um you know we've already tossed out some ideas on what we like to see from the energy community um I'm, I'm the scribe i'm running down all the ideas and probably we're hoping this year that's kind of like one of the main things for the chair that's the thing that he keeps telling us every single week i want to update the inclinations paper i want to update the inclinations paper so it's it's high on his priority list so that's the thing that we're going to be working on well it's great to hear that leo is uh, i recall him in a conversation i had with him as well not too long ago that he mentioned i thought well that's that sounds like an excellent idea if i'm not mistaken so we're now waiting for uh governor green to nominate an individual to serve the balance of what was jennifer potter's term which goes until january 30th of next year 2024 right so that could either be uh, Colin, which I hope it is, because I'm a big fan of Collins, or you know the or the uh, the gov could choose somebody else, and then whoever he chooses would go to the Senate, and first the Energy Committee, which now has Senator Linda Coit as the new uh, chair, uh, who took over for Senator Wakai, and uh, they would make a decision as you went through, right? You went through the committee hearing, and then there's a floor vote on the Senate, and uh, and then that that person would uh, be uh, no longer kind of interim i don't know the exact title is but uh, they would be there you know to serve out jenny's term for the, right. the for, until january 30th or junior 30th of next year so uh, i would think the governor is going to do that sooner rather. i know the ledge just you know started their business so to speak but i would think uh, governor green would do that fairly soon so hopefully there will be uh, you know greater uh, uh, greater certainty as far as kind of the roadmap ahead so you guys can really start cranking on the inclinations paper because it's it's truly such a dramatically kind of new different world now in 2023 compared to 2014 on so many levels so i'm, I'm just really really excited to, to read that but right I, I think uh, from the uh the energy sector side it, it, there really is a need to update the inclinations paper um they they are constantly asking us questions as to where we're leaning um how we're thinking about things and so Rather than doing it on a piecemeal basis, we're hoping to just update the inclinations paper so that they know exactly how we're thinking and how we're approaching problem solving. Well, actually, if you give enough detail in the inclinations paper, uh, they'll save time. They'll know That's where right. you're headed, and they won't they won't um, you know have controversies over things you've already expressed yourself on. This is a good thing. You give them guidance. You know, you, it, it's the right thing to do. Um, you know. Um, we we have we have um, you know issues um, uh, in in government uh, about um, you know openness and and uh, you know trying to telegraph what you're going to do. This is this is really important. But but the other issue, and you mentioned it earlier, is is speed. You know we had we had the uh, special agent in charge of the FBI on the show a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and I said to him, you know. Uh, what what are the myths that you want to dispel in the community? Tell us about the FBI. Tell us <laughs> how you want to straighten people's thinking out so they understand the FBI better. And he said, well, the biggest myth is that we can't do anything fast, uh, that we have to, you know, that we should be doing it faster, um, that uh, it takes a long time, in fact, that people have to understand it takes a long time to make our case. And we keep hearing that with regard to the attorney general in Washington and so forth. But, you know, um, people in general um, on, on every level are always saying, why does government move so slowly? Uh, why can't they just make a decision? Uh, why do we always have to wait? And indeed, you know, 
so many projects that that you know the highways and byways of Hawaii are littered with it, you know companies that that failed because they couldn't get a decision not necessarily from the PUC but you know from some permitting organization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fast enough you know and they burned their capital and all finished now um, so question is what can you do what do you want to do how can you do it to move things faster so that I as a citizen or a businessman would say wow those guys they ruled really quickly I'm impressed. I'm happy. That's the way I want government to be. I think internally, I'm trying to streamline the process um, on how we uh, issue our decisions. Um, so I'm hoping that that will shave off some time, at least uh, at least by a month, um, and also minimize kind of some of the appeal issues. But I think holistically, and, and this is one thing that as a commission we've recognized is working with other agencies so that uh, projects um, aren't stuck in this permitting hell. <laughs> Essentially, it's what I call it. Uh, a lot, not a lot of people realize it. Basically, from the time someone submits an application, it's a five to seven year process to bring something to fruition. And we need to somehow streamline these processes and work together collaboratively with other agencies to so that we can figure out, okay, what is your concern? What is your concern? Let's try to up, uh, address this up front and tell the applicant, hey, these are our concerns. Address it in your application. And I think uh, mm. the PUC is recognizing that we've entered into MOU with uh, DLNR and Water Commission, and we're trying to enter into other MOUs with other agencies. I'm glad to hear yep. that. What about what to... about these cases that involve uh, you know 85 uh, uh, groups that have something to say to you, and they all <laughs> they all want to intervene and speak and and uh, repeat themselves? How do you deal with that? You have to listen to them. You just <laughs> I mean, you have to give people their their. <laughs> Their ability to give comments. I think that's part of the community outreach. I mean, yes, it's a lot of people, but their comments and concerns are just important. And they may provide something useful that you never thought about before. And that's one thing that I learned as an attorney on the development side. And it was painful for my clients to hear, yeah, you got to listen to them. There's something useful out there. Well, and it'll come support. up to a better project. It's a point. Yeah, it's a point well taken because the, in, right in in that talk maybe it repeats itself but in that talk may be an idea that gives you an idea and before you know it you have a dynamic creativity going on mm -hmm. and that way you can deal better with the change let me let me go to uh, some of the things uh, we wanted to ask you about 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 initiatives or directions you know one of them is uh, the Hawaiian Electric's utility scale solar plus storage project you want to comment on that at all uh, not really just because, uh, I mean, it's, <laughs> okay, but, but, it's, 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 um, you know, we're trying to make them work and it's, it's slow. <laughs> okay. How about performance space? I think that's probably something that we are constantly evaluating with Hawaiian Electric. They just went through something. I think it works. I already have. Made some inclinations that I want to change it a bit, but uh, I, I want to see it uh, play out and give some predictability. But we have indicated to Hawaiian Electric where we have some issues. Well, I, I sure like that because it's dynamic. Everything changes. Nothing right. so there's nothing so unchangeable as change, uh, and, and uh, you know you got to roll with it. You got to you got to find the the new the new approach and. Um, and you got to let people know. So I think that's very important that you entertain the notion of change. So one of the things that, that I that I was interested in asking you about was this uh, hydrogen hub idea, which just came up what, a couple of days ago. Right. And the energy department's going to give, uh, you know, seven billion dollars around the country and one billion. of it. Hopefully, if Hawaii plays its cards right, one billion for a hydrogen hub. How does that change the calculus for energy in Hawaii, do you think? And how does it change the role of the PUC? I mean, what is your what is your role at all in a hydrogen hub? Well, you know, we already have some several hydrogen programs, and um, 
if you take a look at state law, there is already established um, within DBID, I believe, uh, a renewable hydrogen program um, to allow the state to transition to a renewable hydrogen economy. And it's something that the legislature has been asking for for quite some time. So personally, I'm very excited about it. If we can develop the hydrogen technology here, that, that's unbelievable. It gives us one more option on the table for us to utilize in reaching our, you know, our goals, our renewable energy goals. Yeah, to, to pull that together with the notion of consistency, um, you know, what, what, what the hydrogen uh, possibility uh, needs is consistency. Consistency in the way you, you develop the hydrogen, build, make the hydrogen, the way you store the hydrogen, the way mm -hmm. you ship the hydrogen, the way you burn the hydrogen. And as a hub out of one of one of seven or eight hubs in the country, you have a lot of Hawaii would have a lot of influence because as a hub, it could, you know, establish these things and it would it would be very persuasive, uh, influential in the hydrogen world. Well, so, wow. And think about where we are in globally. I mean, we are centrally located halfway between the east and the west. I mean, and so from a economic perspective. I mean, that's very exciting for the state. Very ex and it's exciting as a bridge, uh, you know, between Asia and the United States. So yeah, I mean, it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm hoping that we survive to the next round. Uh, yeah, but. yeah. Well we, well, we stand a good chance. I mean, somebody said on the radio that it was one out of three, the way it worked out numerically, one out of three chances. That. Yeah, that'd be fabulous. So, uh, Marco, b before we run here, uh, I wanted to offer you the opportunity of asking about Molokai. You always ask about Molokai. You have a special thing about Molokai, so I wanted to ask about it. Uh, well, yeah, we're kind of short on time, but uh, I wanted to, uh, to riff for a moment on the uh, the D word, as in delays. And, uh, I mean, I've been in this business for, for a long, long time, and specifically here in Hawaii for 23 years. And... You know, I've I've seen my share of delays on multiple levels, and I just want to note. And I think I sent you a piece on this earlier uh, this week, Naomi, from the Wall Street Journal, which is you know with the Inflation Reduction Act and the release of a lot of money for green tech for projects across the United States. That what we are dealing with, and what Hawaiian Electric is dealing with, what the developers are dealing with uh, here in Hawaii is not by any means unique. That there, it's more what's uh, going on as well on the mainland with projects that are being delayed, 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 utilities having a difficult time having adequate staff, adequate uh, uh, resources uh, to be able to, and just supply line issues, which of course COVID is, has exacerbated that. So, you know, our, our field of vision of course is Hawaii, you know, cause we live here, right? That's where we make our lives. Uh, this This is not by any, uh, stretch a one-off thing, what we're dealing with here. This is nationwide. So uh, I'm not using that as an excuse, but I just wanted to to add that. Thank you. I, I totally agree. I mean, it's not a, na it's a nationwide issue. Um, and talking to my colleagues on the mainland, they're all experiencing the same type of issues that Hawaii is. And just yeah. kind of, a, you know, well, an we can do better, all. right? We can always do better. And I think what we can, we Sorry. what we can do as a commission is basically uh, try to speed up the process internally to not add to that delay. Yeah. I think that's what we can do. So uh, that didn't sound much like a discussion uh, over Molokai, um, but hey, <laughs> my dear grandmother, my dear beloved grandmother, Molokai is involved. So could you dear... ask about Molokai before we run out of time, Marco? Sure, sure. So there was the announcement recently between Hawaiian Electric and Ho'ahu, not Oahu, but Ho'ahu Energy Cooperative, which has a number of uh, partners as well, that uh, there's agreement, at least in principle, for two projects on the island of Molokai, near and dear to my heart, has been for 50 plus years, uh, to have utility scale uh, solar plus storage at the Palaau, the one and only eco power plant there on the island, and then another smaller solar plus storage up in Kuala Pu. So, uh, what's your take on that? I mean, I know it's it's, it's new, and they, you probably don't even have the have the uh, the documentation submitted yet. But I guess just kind of first glance, what's your take? 
Um, I know that Hawaiian Electric has been working really hard on getting something on Molokai. I, 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 I don't know how many correspondences have we've gotten on their efforts to try and get something like this on Molokai. Um, so I'm excited that there is some type of project uh, in the works. I haven't seen the applications at all, so I can't comment one way or the other on any of the details. But yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, we're at the next stage and I look forward to taking a look at the application and seeing you know, uh, how much of the, um, you know, the energy it's, it's it solves as well as what are the impacts to the community. Yeah, well, one of the cool things, of course, is that, you know, the, the that's a relatively small island, comparatively speaking, mm -hmm. uh, 3,000 some odd rate pairs of no mistake in general population, about 7,000. So uh, when you throw several megawatts uh, of solar plus storage, I mean, you can start getting into substantial percentages yep. of uh, the power demands of the island electricity wise being met by renewable energy plus storage. So, uh, you know, it's going to be. I have no doubt a long, long slog because I've done commercial projects on Molokai and it's uh, it's a different challenge than working on any of the other uh, so bigger islands. So I'd be right. Just trying to get um, equipment there is a nightmare. I mean, yeah. so I agree with you. Thank you, Naomi. It's been great Thank to you, have Jay. you on the show. You are such a nice person. We really appreciate having the discussion. And Marco is a nice person too, although never feels exactly the same. Oh, way. Marco's always very, uh, very nice. <laughs> Such a total gentleman. Aloha, you both. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.